All right, who's ready? Everybody ready? Cool, all right. All right, so my name is Sean Rakijic. A lot of you already know me. Thank you for watching uh, me through a camera lens most of the time that you see me. And thanks for putting up with my ads. I know that we've had a couple people talk about that lady. Um, but so uh, let's start from the beginning. Uh, I want to just introduce kind of how I got into real estate, where I'm at with it, and how I can help you. The goal of this is to just do a monthly free resource for anybody who cares about real estate. And it doesn't have to be rental arbitrage. A lot of you know that's what I do, um, but I'm more of a business owner and I love business. Real estate is a sector of that. You can do lots of stuff with real estate and that doesn't actually have to be rental arbitrage or house hacking, which he got me uh, attuned to. Uh, so with that said, um, I started a business a long time ago in the newspaper industry. As many of you know, newspapers aren't exactly the most profitable lately, kind of hard to be profitable in. But uh, that's what made me kind of the person I am today, just fighting a losing battle constantly with clients that like, we can make it. I'm like, yes, you can, I hope. <laughs> Let's get there. Uh, so I spent a lot of time learning how to run businesses in really hard to thrive environments. So when I hit Airbnb, uh, it was just like, it's like like training in, in like the planet that Beerus lives on with the Dragon Ball Z, you no? Know? Okay. Oh, but anyway, yeah, you get that, right? right? So you, you, tra you train where it's really hard and then your ankle weights come off and you rerun a lot faster. King Kai's planet, that's right. Uh, that was one of them, but they're actually Lord Beerus is more gravity. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yes! Sorry, Dragon Ball Z for everyone. Uh, so I got into Airbnb 2014, 2015 because I moved employees to a building, gave them free rent as a relocation package. Some of you already know this story. When they moved out, I needed a place, I needed to spend money on empty apartments and Airbnb became my solution to paying rent for somewhere I wasn't living. And I was renting there because my company had signed leases there. So that building told me I could not do what I was doing, which is put it on Airbnb. So I started digging through the lease and in 2014, nobody had language in a lease about Airbnb yet, right? Airbnb wasn't anything yet. So I was like, well, technically I'm an LLC, so I'm not subletting. I'm actually declaring a different occupant. I just happened to find them through Airbnb. And that became my argument for a couple of years and it was solid. I just decided to plan for leasing agents to call me to tell me that I couldn't. And I would very politely say, well, let me walk you through the lease. I can. And that worked for a really long time until the TAA lease changed in Houston and you, the paragraph 30 started putting like, you cannot list on lodging websites. And from there we had to start finding a new way to like get permission to do rental arbitrage. Uh, but by then the Super Bowl was coming in Houston, which you know, you know. Um, and so we just stacked on apartments because that would be like the most profitable weekend ever. And we crushed it that weekend. And then from there I started taking it seriously and like reinvesting my money into Airbnb. And so we've gone, we've gone from at that point, February 2017 was the Super Bowl to now we've gone from 10 listings to like 55 listings just from reinvesting the money that we have made. So there's never any debt on the startup. There's no outside investors, no equity share partners, no personal credit. Like it's just been, it's been a real fun journey because we just took some money that we had like four thousand dollars and just let that snowball and so rental arbitrage has been good for me for that for that reason because i could just kind of do it as it was legitimately a side gig i thought my media company was going to be like my my big thing right um but airbnb kind of like just came out of nowhere and became a, a monster of an opportunity and keep in mind keep saying we but it's all him the entire time i was like you're crazy man. well we we have employees right the company has employees and i guess that's where my we comes from is because i don't run the business i i mean alberto and i sit in this office most days of the week working on content planning the the class or the courses everything else i'm not talking to guests from my airbnb like listings, because I have multiple like listings and users. I don't, I, we were in Costa Rica for a couple weeks. As soon as I, I haven't worked on my Airbnb business since I went to Costa Rica. Yeah, so the we is, people are running it for me, which is part of like, you can create a pseudo passive income with Airbnb if it's rental arbitrage. Uh, this gentleman here, he has a couple of his own. He, he's a real estate agent, so he specializes in finding places um, either to lease, which is how I, I was picking up all my leases with, was with Sean, but he also sells homes. And so he picked up a couple of his own and he's been crushing it. There's one property he might tell you about actually that we, we clean for him. It's a big one. And he makes a lot of money on that. Um, Richard here, he uh, is a traditional landlord first. Some of you who buy homes and then put like a normal person in there to live for a year or longer. Um, and uh, Richard's been making his way into taking his multiple properties and moving into the, in the, to the Airbnb space. All thanks to this guy. And you're going to rent one day too. You're going to do some arbitrage, maybe pepper it in there. Pepper it in there. Well, I mean, you you I own. A little bit of yeah, he's, he's a, he actually now has an app 
um, that he is working with Airbnb hosts like myself in order to gain market share, uh, but it's to help people when they're traveling on Airbnb find places to go when they're in Dallas. So it's a really cool product. He might mention that too. So without further ado, I'm going to, how do we, who's got a coin to flip? We got to choose which guy has to speak We can next. do uh, rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. All right, let me sit back. We're doing one, two, three, shoot, or one, two, shoot? Uh, well, first of all, how do you don't shoot me? This is just okay. rock, paper, scissors, not that intense. All right. uh, yeah, just one, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. Oh. One, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. Ha! Ah, you knew it! You knew it! <laughs> all right, so you, you, you call it. You next, or? Uh, you can go next, man. All right. Okay. Uh, my name's Richard, Healthy Uh I'm going to tell you a little that bit of background funny. of where I'm at now, and then jump to the real estate and how I got here. So. Uh, we just created Instahat, and just there's my one plug, but I wouldn't be able to do it without real estate. So eight years ago, nine years, eight years ago, I stumbled into my first property, my first investment property. And I didn't know I was a real estate investor then, but I was, and it was really cool. So it was in college, I was renting a room out, or yeah, I was renting a room from a landlord, had two other roommates, and uh, I was working at a gas station, making some good money at a gas station, right? And uh, I decided, you know, since I'm working full time, making this good money, it's time for me to buy a house. So I was encouraged by my mother and <laughs> encouraged by friends around me. It's like, should I do this? Should I not do this? But, you know, I got that little push from friends and family, which was great. And I'm glad they did. So uh, 2009, 2010, uh, called up my landlord. I'm like, yo, this is my 60 days. I'm out. He's like, what? And I'm like, because we were such great tenants, we were there for like two years. And uh, I said, but I'm looking to buy a house. You interested in selling? And uh, he said yes. So direct to the owner, we didn't use a realtor. So we got, we, I negotiated the price down. So this is kind of like my jumping, like stumbling into real estate investment without knowing. So went straight through a title company. The house needed some work. And because I lived there, I knew what work it needed. So it was like, well, the garage door's been broken, and there's a hole in the wall from the last tenant. And uh, yeah, so um, I, I got a good deal on the property, right? So now I bought this property. I, I'm already living it with you know two other fellows, and they're paying me rent now. So instead of me forking out five fifty, six hundred a month for rent utilities, I'm paying utilities, hundred fifty bucks a month. I'm going to college part time. I'm working full time at a gas station. Uh, and I got into that property with uh, 9,500 out of pocket, which is, I would say, is, is fairly good for a first deal. Yeah. Uh, with equity built into the home, with, uh, you know, not cash flowing positive, but I dropped my expenses down 450 bucks. Sweet. So, you know, I went on the school year that, and then I went on the school year for the rest of the year, and then next year I, I was making some good money, and I was like, let me see if I can do this again. Like, this is cool. And so the next year I bought another home, in Denton again. I rented out the other one, rented out the two rooms on the next one. And this time I found the property because my friends were renting the house. And so <laughs> I was like, okay, this, so it worked for me once. Let me see if it'll work again. So I called up their landlord. I'm like, hey, you don't know me, but I know your tenants. And negotiated a deal, no realtor. And I, I guess this is just a string of good luck in these two years. And now I was going to, I was making like 300 bucks a month, going to school part-time, working at a gas station, had you know one house with you know two houses with equity built into it where I put a little bit of work in, and that, that's kind of how I fell into real estate. Uh, I guess it was like ten years ago almost. But so that's uh, the beginning of it. And then <laughs> later on, you know, as I'm, I'm, I'm learning how to do these different things, moving up in my my gas station career, and uh, you know, slowly dropped out of school. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I do have to mention the second house. I did better than the first one. And I was out of pocket $7,000 with like $15,000 in equity in it, uh, you know, cash flowing. So it was, really, it was really sweet. So the cash on cash return, if you guys are familiar with rentals, was awesome. This was, you know, pre-Airbnb. So I thought that was sweet. Mm -hmm. and, th <laughs> and then, uh, you know, fast forward a few years, and this was two years ago. Three years, eh, man, two and a half years ago, I married my wife, moved into a house. It was a four-bedroom house. There's only two of us. And uh, so we had these two extra rooms. You house hacked with your wife? Yeah, dude. <laughs> that's, a, that's a keeper. Yeah, yeah. Dude, awesome. That's nice. So we had two extra rooms, and one of them had like an exterior wall. We threw a door in it, and I was like, honey, I think we can Airbnb this. I think this will be cool. So this was almost two years ago, and that was our first Airbnb experience. That was, that was sweet. So that was cash flowing. 
a uh, thousand bucks a month for just a room, right? And I was like, okay, there's something something going on here. <laughs> and during that same time, I started. A, I met a guy named Shane Hickey, and he's actually co-founded Instahap with me too. But we also co-founded a real estate company, and it was, uh, you know, we were buying houses, flipping houses, long-term running them, and stuff like that. We're both very passionate about that, and. Uh, and I was like, man, we got to try this Airbnb thing out. Like, it worked for me this past year. We got to try it out, right? So last September, we jumped into it with a full house, uh, with one of our houses. We we said, okay, we're going to long-term rent this. And like off the races, like month one, it was just huge returns we've never seen before. Like three times, four times what we would get gross on a long-term rent. So now it's a matter of you know finding how can we uh, how can we run this machine leaner, right? So just because you're making that much gross, you're still paying people to clean it. You're, you got supplies and stuff like that. So we need to be lean. And I was in a short-term rental meeting in uh, where I live, and this old man named Woody comes up to me. He's like, hey, you're a young guy in real estate. This is so cool. <laughs> and he's like, check this out. You got to check out this guy. Uh, what do you say? Yeah, it's, it's called Airbnb Automated on YouTube, right? And so that was uh, my introduction to Sean without him knowing me. Um, that was in December, I think, last year. And just some sweet stuff, like, definitely helped our business run way more lean. So now the plan is uh, we buy a house, we flip it so we can, you know, we have equity in it to sell it. It's prime for long-term hold if we need to, but we short-term run it to see if it performs. So we're in different cities to see what's performing, what's not, what's bringing people in. And uh, that is, uh, that's our game plan so far. Short-term rentals have surpassed long-term, but I'm glad we have that safety net in case some city ordinances come in or state, state laws that don't allow us. But uh, thanks to Sean, we're, uh, we're running a much leaner business, and it's, uh, it's been super effective. And so we're opening up our next Airbnb probably in two weeks in McKinney, right in the historical district. It's going to be sweet. Solid. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Congrats. Nice. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> I'm such a coffee shop kid. <laughs> All right, I'll get some more uh, It's Sean Ray, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean. Uh, okay, so I am, I am the behind-the-scenes guy for this uh, homeboy right here. So it was 1985 when I was born. No, uh, That's right. That's I don't true. know how far back of a story you guys want to hear, but um, basically the key points are uh, I moved to Houston, uh, didn't have a plan, didn't know anybody, and then I ended up living out of my car without air conditioning, and that was intense for a long time. The thing that got me into real estate and got me success-minded and like the law of attraction, I think, to track this guy into my life was the fact that the only place I had air conditioning because I didn't have an apartment at the time was uh, a Starbucks that also was attached to Barnes & Noble. And so I was just sitting there during the day because it's so hot in Houston, so humid in Houston. You have, oh yeah, you guys know. <laughs> yeah. um, and I made a conscious decision to quit my job. Well, I got fired, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> I, I left in, in June of 2012 and, uh, and then I, I went down to Houston and then I didn't have a single plan. But I was like, people are making money in Houston and I'm not making money in Dallas. And so let's try Houston out for a while. And uh, that was not a conscious decision that I would make again if I were to go back, but it worked out. So anyways, um, I would hang out in Barnes and Noble and I would go to the self-help section, like the, you know, the Robert Kiyosaki's and all that stuff like that. And then I was like, attract money in my life because I got none. <laughs> so anything's better than this. Uh, I just wanted to fix my air conditioning. Um, but, uh, but they have free water, Starbucks, so that's cool. Um, but, so I just kept on reading these books and reading these books and kept on just like, I'm controlling my life and I'm bringing money into my life and success is about to find me. And, um, and then I started reading more about real estate books. And so, because I was trying to put my mind on focus on success and I was also reading about real estate, then I think that it just so happened to work out magically that I met this guy when I had a bar. I used to go out in like a suit because I only had, I had like jeans, a t-shirt and I had like a suit. That's all I had. And I had the same suit because it was like my prom suit or something like that from like high school. Um, and I had like a backpack. And so I'd go out every night and I'd be drinking every night to network, but I didn't have any money. So I'd have like a glass of water and a lime and I'd be like, vodka, vodka. <laughs> What's your story? Uh, are you guys hiring where you work at? What? No, I'm, I'm not looking for a job. But if I was, are you guys hiring? <laughs> and so I would just do that like every night until I, I met enough That's people great. to one night. Uh, I did meet a guy 
we connected and uh, and then he was a trust fund baby, worked out for me because um, he's like, man, I love your tenacity. I know now once he got to hear my story, he's like, if you just put that same kind of passion into real estate, then you would kill it. And so uh, this guy ended up just paying for my real estate license. Nice dude. And he didn't know what to do with his money. He just had too much money. And he was a real estate agent. I was like, dude, you do nothing all day. Like all he does is he just hangs out by the pool, gets a tan, and, um, and he just plays on his phone. He was making like three grand a month. And I was like, I, three grand to me was rich. I was like, how are you making three grand a month and you do nothing, man, like nothing. And so, um, so I ended up doing that. And so I got the real estate license because of him. And my first year I hit six figures. And that was awesome because I didn't know any different. Like no one said that real estate agents normally 90% fall out. No one told me that you know the average real estate agent makes thirty-two thousand dollars a year. I didn't know any of these things. I was like, I just want to run as hard as I can. I was super hungry, like I was starving, and um, and so I did really well my first year. Introduced to this guy because like I was Mr. Top Gun. I was like, I'm making six figures. I'm the man. And so then they're like, Hey, there's another Sean that makes six figures or more. At the time, he was actually making millions, but. Uh, so he introduced us, and then we got uh, the friendship kindling, and uh, he allowed me to help him out. And I say allow because he really can do this all on his own. Like I'm not like he's like, hey, can you help me find apartments? Because I know that they give you commission, and so I can do this on my own, or I can just basically use you, and you take care of the stress for me, and then whatever. And so we just picked up a couple of units at first. It's like, man, this Airbnb thing. I don't. I, sh I wouldn't get too excited about that. He was talking about the the um, Super Bowl coming and I was like man don't over leverage yourself man because I mean like I don't think this is going to work at all like this is don't don't get too heavily invested in this just focus on your normal business he's like well, I think I'm gonna try it out I think I'm gonna get a limo and I'm gonna have a package it's like 10 grand and it's gonna be like a bottle service and I'm gonna have like a photographer and maybe we can rent out some models for these people and I was like what are you talking about and so I thought he was nuts turns out he's a genius um, and so since then he's just been allowing me to help him get all the units and I am very thankful for it because uh, again, like I said, he doesn't even do this on his own, but uh, I saw the rise and the entire time, like, bro, he's doing a YouTube channel, like, no one cares, like, you don't have enough content for this. And then he does. And I was like, I don't think you can scale this. He did. And um, I don't know if this is going to make that much money and it does. And so the entire time I'm like, man, I'm just, whatever you want to do, bro, I just, I think you're crazy, but it turns out you got to be crazy to make crazy money. And so that's awesome. A lot of, I'm really proud of you, man. Thanks. Um, now, what I do is, that's my story, that's how I'm here, I moved to Dallas, and you moved to Dallas too, in school. Um, and so what I do is, I'm a real estate agent, I sell homes like all real estate agents, and I also do apartment locating. Uh, and then I, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll go into my segment and break down like what my topic is for a day later, but basically, um, I got into real estate uh, investing because I bought a house and I was trying to do the standard real estate investing model that he was talking about and typically you make like a hundred dollar profit a month on top of your lease if you're lucky to get 200 and then something happened where I had Airbnb out to the rooms with his advice and uh, then it started doubling my mortgage I was in free which can I talk to you guys about a little later and, um, and I was like man that's great so now I help all a lot of my clients right now just people that basically are coming to me I identify homes and they say, I need to find a good home that would go good on Airbnb. And so these people that I've been helping out, like I got one guy that's about to, like he could retire right now off like one house that we just killed it on. This other girl, she's matched her income on two houses. And so like now I'm all fired up about retiring people through Airbnb investing. Again, I don't know if this is gonna be something that's gonna be like for the next 20, 30 years, but for right now, this is a great way to get into real estate investing. And I'm really fired up about taking people out of their have to like chain to a desk job and then do the job you want to do because Airbnb allows you that income to not have to be chained to your boss that's telling you to do like forms and paperwork. You're like, why am I doing this? This is not what I was born for. And so that's my thing now. That's my passion. I want to try to retire people and I can do it because I met this guy. Or because Thanks you're a good sir. real estate agent. There's that too. Whatever. I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come raise. Uh, That was fun. It was a good story. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. how far back to go. I was like, I, I like that the whole. I'm I'm not looking for a job, but if I was, <laughs> I like that a lot. Cool. Um, so now that you know these gentlemen and know myself, uh, the next part of this is just we're just going to start firing questions, so that way we can answer some for you. 
um, and then network afterwards because if you guys have grand ideas on what you could do in real estate and you think that any of us can help you find a way to make it happen, um, that's what we're here for moving forward. So um, I don't have a, a method for choosing people so we could all rock, paper, scissors again for who gets asked <laughs> questions or we can come up with something a little less violent. So um, who has a question that they would like to fire away first? All right, fast hands. Hey guys, my name's Greg. Um, I Hi. wanted to actually talk about where the market is going and kind of how saturated it's gotten in recent years or recent months. Um, what are some of the things you guys are doing to differentiate your units to make sure that they get booked? And mm. Sean, I'd like you to talk about your um, unicorn uh, apartment <laughs> that you just set up. Nice. And talk about some of the things that you did within that unit to make it themed, but still keep your um, initial investment low. Um, so, you know, marketable, but you know, you use yeah. some creative tactics to where you didn't invest sure. too much to get it to cash flow immediately. So first is how to differentiate. We'll talk about where Airbnb is going, which is kind of leading into saturation, how to combat oversaturation with differentiation, and then talk about the unicorn house. That sounds, do you want to reset that just in case? Um, it's good. Okay, cool. Um, do either of you guys have anything that you guys do currently to That's set your... That's a lot of questions, so I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a quick one just yeah. on one of my houses, and then we'll just let you go. Yeah. And then, are, am I going to do the topic on like? Do you still want me to do the, the the overall speaking topic? Yeah, I'm sure it's probably going to come up in a question. If it doesn't, we can probably wrap up with some final like takeaways, cool. like send them off. Uh, so I have a property that uh, that I'll talk about you guys in a little bit. My my topic for today is about house hacking, how to get started in real estate with uh, with very low, no money down, and to get paid to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, really mm -hmm. want to talk to you guys about that because I think it's important for everyone to know. But to answer your question, I have I have one property in particular that we call the Monster House. Mm -hmm. And I bought this house specifically for the reason of like taking a huge risk because I don't know anybody that did what I did on this house. And I was like, I'm gonna see if it works, and it turned out mm -hmm. to work a lot. Yeah. Uh, I bought the house for the purpose of events. I wanted to find a big open spot that is going to have four bedroom, four baths, big backyard. I was going to make the backyard look great. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to put a lot of money. I'm going to throw a lot of money at this and see if it works. And it turned out it did. And so a lot of people are booking my place. Like I have bookings that sometimes go up to like 15, no, a little bit, uh, 15 to $2,000 a night uh, just for this event space. And so I think Airbnb allows you to do the, the transient people that are just like one night, like in and out, or people that are going to be in just for vacation for a short amount of time and they just need an alternative for a large group for hotels. But then there's this other untapped market that I wanted to just try out, which is the, we don't want to pay for our wedding. Like I get a lot of weddings too, backyard weddings. Like I, that's a thing. Um, but we don't want to pay for a hotel or an event space for a bachelorette party or a bridal show, whatever it is. Um, we want to rent out your plot or your, your house. And so turns out that was really profitable. And so for me, I differentiated myself on the market because that is an event space. It's an Airbnb rental, but it really is an event house. Like I don't really have any anyone coming in during the week. It's always it's like single night rents on Friday and Saturday. And through that I'm able to make like average ten, sometimes fifteen K a month on just that one house. Uniform house? Okay, so yeah, so that's his differentiation strategy is allow events, which most of us don't, right? Allow parties where we say no parties. Uh, what about you? Yeah, so this McKinney house I was talking about, we learned early on uh, that the more unique that you can make your property, uh, the, the, the higher the occupancy rate. That was an early on lesson. And I think we take advantage of the fact that we buy houses to flip, to build equity into them. So we can control like all those variables of like, hey, let's throw up something eclectic here, some sweet artwork over here. Let's rip out this kitchen and redo it all. So we have that opportunity to to create a space. We're not buying at retail. We're not buying nice houses. We're buying you know dumps that we want to create something awesome out of. So this McKinney house we're finishing up is actually kind of I, I guess I don't know what your unicorn house is yet. I'm excited for it, but this is. Uh, you know, I guess our unicorn house, unless yours is the literal unicorn house. It's literally the unicorn house. Oh, it's literally yeah. unicorn house. Okay, well, mm -hmm. we, uh, we took things like a closet and uh, walled it off on one side, opened it up on another side, put a bookshelf door. So there's a little handle you gotta find, open it up to open the bookshelf. 
we took a um, upstairs. So this house was built in the 1870s. It's called the Bonnie and Clyde House. It's in McKinney because it's near uh, Bonnie and Clyde. You know, they used to pass through McKinney all the time. But upstairs, there's another area with an armoire in it. And you pull out the drawers of the armoire and you can go through it into a very, like a little small room, right? And then we have a area in the hallway upstairs where there's a wire running. You can't see it through the attic around it and you pull a picture frame down and then a wall with wainscoting 30 feet away clicks open and there's this you know 100 square foot room in there right so all these little secret rooms and we're telling a story as it so when we open this up that's going to be something unique we're going to try and we're, uh, we're going to try to tell a story like hey this house was in a major fire it's where bonnie and clyde used to hide you know make it really cool looking and uh hey there's some secret rooms in here see if you can find them and if we can get an extra 20 dollars a night on that we're gonna hit our ROI on the extra stuff in six months. So that, I mean, so you mentioned the price versus, you know, how much you can get back in it. So our bet is uh, $20 a night more than your average three bedroom, three bathroom home. So we do a lot of research on the front end to see kind of what people are running them out ahead of time. But uh, where uh, the extra $20 a night came from just came from our other properties where they're not unique in that sense but they're all completely remodeled showroom ready homes. And when properties are, let's say they're running for $150 a night, we're capitalizing at like two and a quarter. And we're getting it. It's because, you know, we, uh, on the front end, we spend the extra money to do that. But, you know, you mentioned what's your ROI on that. A little bit every night creates a huge spread every month. So 20 bucks a night is uh, $400 a month. Or more than that. Well, it depends on your occupancy. Yeah, yeah. on occupancy, at that. least $400 a month. At least, yeah. Yeah. for sure. And so, I mean, yeah, uniqueness sells. Yeah, and uh, to his point, that'll create more of a local buzz, too, because if you can create something that people want to talk about and share, you might be able to get a write up, right? And, you know, you used to pull people for PR, like for write ups, too. You used to submit things. That was, he, he marketed an event and he made it happen because he was able to push to get journalists to write about it. And he said the journalists are too busy. To, to like come up with new stories to talk about. So if you give them a pre-written something or another, they'll, they'll, they might run it if it's good enough. Especially Culture Map. Culture Map Houston and Dallas, I mean, they're just, they'll just give them content and they'll publish Yeah, it. you give them good content. So that's something you could do. And that's our plan for Philly that's piggybacks completely on the Unicorn House. So step one, um, who here knows what the main color of the walls are in any Airbnb space you stay at? First comes to mind, what color are the walls? White. Yeah, so white or beige, right? Step one, differentiate, paint the walls a different color. That's uh, probably the cheapest, most high contrast thing you can do to a space. Um, and that's the point, differentiation by contrast. If you look at design principles or um, uh, a, co a composition theory for like photography or video, um, if I put five marbles on a table that are, four of them are white and one of them is lime green, where does your eye go? To the one lime green marble, right? Contrast. So if you see hundreds of listings on Airbnb, and they're all done by big corporate, like multi-million dollars, like Sondra has over $200 million to play with. Lyric, Airbnb just put $160 million into Lyric, by the way, and then there's Domeo and other big ones like Stay Alfred, and so all these places have their own kind of like approach, and if they pick up 30 or 40 apartments and have the same design philosophy, if you throw something that's high contrast into the market, you'll get booked, not because yours is better, but because people are flipping through listings like this, and then they see yours, and they're like, wow, this is different. Different creates a sense of scarcity, creates a sense of impulse and causes people to book. So we painted a color on all the walls that is like, like cartoon sky blue, right? And then we hired a muralist to paint unicorns all over the walls, right? Um, our local manager, John Rico, he handles all of our management in Philadelphia. He actually illustrated the unicorns because he can draw. And then we brought in a muralist to, to fill them out and paint. And the muralist on the first floor also created like a forest, like a forest theme before they come up the staircase. So it's like a forest with like a unicorn in the forest and stuff. And then they walk up into the sky is kind of like the thing. The, the reason why we did the, the theme for this property is because nobody wants to live there because for the price, they're trying to say it's a three bedroom, but one of the bedrooms is super, super small. So we turned that into a media room. And we have like a unicorn on the wall with like the blue and red like 3D glasses with popcorn watching TV. Um, so that's what we did with that room. But you couldn't turn it into a three bedroom unless you found like college students who were really, really willing to live in a like a subprime environment for long term. So this place, people can totally tolerate a three bedroom where the rooms aren't the proper size 
if we give them incentive to. So I lowballed the landlord, said I will give you like like eight percent less in rent than the last tenants were getting. He then comes back says, no, we actually, we want to charge $300 more a month. And so he told me, no, I'm like, oh, well, we'll be here. A month and a half later, he calls me back and says, okay, we'll take your deal. I'm like, and two weeks free. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, okay, we'll take your deal. <laughs> so it gave us an extra two weeks to do the build out. So um, we signed a longer term lease, like two years with this guy. Um, and then we started it out. First, we painted the walls. And then of course, we, we planned out how it would look. We, we basically surveyed it and said, what's the, what's the limitations of the property and why? Um, why are we going to do certain things? So by, by with the oh, unicorn theme house, it's a lot of like bright colors. It is designed to be a little bit more manic. So the key for this type of theme is to be busy. Like the walls have to be adorned with stuff. So we bought a lot of like uh, cloud decals and we made basically a crown molding where it's all clouds around the top, right? And then we got a bunch of like unicorn uh, signs like caution unicorn crossing stuff like that we got co coffee cups that are like unicorns unicorn handles says I don't believe in humans on them like it's there's just a, everything is cute so everything is a photo opportunity right everything is a chance for social media um, and that's why a lot of people stay in Airbnbs is for the wow factor like when we were in uh, um, Koh Samui that big big place that we stayed at people would stay at this $800 a night mansion in the hills of Koh Samui so they could be like bam bam with their friends and our friends were just all about it right so it works you either have like this huge opulent like look at how expensive this place is we're staying in like the richest pad ever like thing and people will be like flashing it or people will be like well how cute is this like this is insane i've never seen a place like it and so um if i was going to try to put it all in the nutshell of course paint for contrast pick a color take the risk on the color right buy your furniture around some sort of themed color model and then in my case for this theme you make the place busy and you can buy a lot of stuff to cover a lot of space like decals that go on the walls like posters are cheaper than actual paintings stuff like that so you can really cover a lot of square footage on the walls for very little money um, and we're also um, we're actually in the process of illustrating quotes in all the dead space on the wall so he's like sketching out the quote and we're just gonna use black paint so like a lot of Walt Disney um, uh, Maya Angelou, like just a lot of like really prominent people who have like a, like a big imagination, a lot of inspiring quotes. Um, and that's kind of how we're filling the dead space in the wall. Um, and that's it. We didn't have to buy anything expensive. Just everything had to kind of flow in this sky blue, pink, unicorn-esque thing. And it's just, it's, it actually, it, the one last thing that really matters is congruence, right? If you have one room that isn't themed and it's just like a blah room, it ruins the magic. So it has to, there can't be any cracks in your game, right? You can't have a bathroom that's just like, oh, this is a bathroom, right? <laughs> this has to be a unicorn bathroom, right? So you really have to commit and make sure that you don't neglect any part of your property if you're going to theme it. It should all really be, it's all part of the same magical experience. Did you, Hope that helps. Did you ever see the commercial with the, the unicorn that does the ice cream? As his... so, uh, we were going to buy Squatty Potties for the place, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, put Squatty Potties Yeah, we were thinking about it. Just um, put, like pictures of that little unicorn in the bathroom. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be cool, actually, to like screen capture it and then try to find a way to enlarge it. Or just make it a sticker that goes on the, uh, sure, on the toilet. You can. Cool. Those guys were awesome. Um, Sean, real quick question, just to build on that, sorry. Did you stick to your typical budget when you were building out this house, or did you go? No, it's imp it's impossible to stick to your typical budget. If you paint the walls on a three bedroom home, we paid like twenty five hundred dollars to paint. Um, then we spent fifteen hundred dollars on the muralist to do all the the maybe no hold on no it wasn't fifteen hundred. Um, there's a thousand on the muralist, but we also had to buy the supplies and stuff. So um, on the painting of the walls alone was an extra four grand. And then if you buy a bunch of knickknacks, but this is a three bedroom home, like multi-floor three bedroom home. So if you repainted a studio, you're not looking at a $2,500 paint job. You can also paint on your own if it's simple enough. Yeah. But I wasn't around to paint the three bedroom on my own and it was a, going to be a complex paint job, so I wasn't going to do it. So. Uh, painting doesn't take forever, so you can plan for it. It will just take a couple extra days because paint has to dry and then you do your second coat. I mean, if you, you can Google how to paint and they'll tell you. Um, but yeah, so 4000 extra on the custom artwork on the walls. And then we've probably spent um, probably an extra 1500 to $2,000 as opposed to what we would normally spend on things. Because those unicorn cups aren't like cheap coffee cups. Yeah. They're not as cheap. Right, um, a rainbow type metal uh, wine opener was a couple dollars more than a regular one, and all the extra paintwork and the decals and all the extra. We bought tons of unicorn 
um, stuffed animals that'll go in the media room. So it's like a mountain of unicorn stuffed animals. And we bought unicorn pajamas because we're going to do photo shoot. When we do the photos for the Airbnb, we're going to be in unicorn pajamas with everything on in some of the photos, right? So we're going to like, and we're going to have the unicorn pajamas for sale though. People can buy the stuff. Everything in the space is for sale essentially. So that is a return on investment there too. Sonder actually does that. They work with a company called Full House and one of the one of the big execs for Sonder left Sonder in order to service them with the full house concept, which they do all the custom design for Sonder's properties, fill the space up with properties, and then everything in the property is for sale. Um, and that's kind of how Sonder and full house work together. So you accommodate that same model, which is uh, you keep some of the stuff in boxes. So somebody wants, you should always keep extra stuff anyway. You should have an extra TV on hand at all times. If somebody steals or breaks a TV, you don't want your next reservation to get ruined. So you just ship that TV into the apartment, quick set it back up, and then buy another TV, right? So you should have certain stuff extra, even some expensive stuff. So things that people would typically want to buy, like the unicorn coffee cups or the unicorn pajamas, you just keep them in a locked closet where people could buy them from you and be like, yeah, here, just uh, ship me the money on Venmo or through Airbnb, and then you just replace it. So you're, you're, almost your inventory control should accommodate the idea of reselling some of this extra stuff. So yeah, to, just like him, uh, we're spending an extra couple thousand dollars on the interior um, after the cost of paint. Thanks. Yeah, but we expect it to be booked by all locals. Like local birthday parties will be big. We expect to get a lot of write-ups from people because this is gonna be the weirdest Airbnb anybody's ever seen. That's kind of the goal. Yeah, um, a lot of my bookings for the Monster House are local. Mm -hmm. There's people in the area that don't have a place to do stuff. Yep, five-year-old birthdays, unicorn this, unicorn that. Yeah. yeah. Do you Should. have a question? Yep. Yeah, for the newbies who are trying to expand, do you recommend to strictly stay by lo prime locations to find the rentals? Mm. The prime locations will change. You, location matters. We'll tell you that, right? You can't have a place in the middle of nowhere and expect it to perform the same as something like yeah. on the prime strip. But if you know where people go and why, you can find a prime location that people aren't thinking about. Right? So in Houston, the red line is it's an obvious one. Anything on the red line, because it gets downtown into energy, medical center. So a lot of my properties are on the red line. And uh, Sonder has been picking up stuff on the red line too. If you're in the medical center, people are coming to the medical center for a different reason than if you're coming to downtown Houston. So how you build out your property and kind of what you advertise should be in accordance to that. Um, Airbnb called me about, um, about a, a need that they have, which is disabled friendly spaces. So if you wanted to have slightly less prime location near the medical center, but still perform as well as the medical center, you could just make sure that your spaces are dis disabled friendly, like no step access, wide doorways, um, try to get a guardrail in the bathroom, stuff like that, and research how to like make your like up to code disable friendly. And there's actually a new section, and some of you might have seen it on the Airbnb platform, where it'll say accessibility features. You click on it, it's gonna ask you how accessible your space is, and they'll want you to take photo proof of the doorway is actually no step in wide and stuff like that. So, so I guess in a weird answer to your point, the location is relative to the traveler. So you want to really look at your traveler and decide what is prime location for them. Because what's prime location for you is not the same as your traveler. And then I want to jump in. That's on the rental arbitrage side on, on what, because we do, I feel like to make that clear, we do something a little differently. Like mm -hmm. he does rental arbitrage and I buy houses and then I turn them into Airbnb investments, just to make clear. Uh, so when you're doing my side of it, then what is location is very important. And so, because I do a hybrid, and so kind of like what he used to do, um, which everyone used to do, is you buy a property that's next to an area of town that's hot, and then you don't want to pay the hot prices, and so you want to pay the prices next to the hot prices, and then that way you can un get under list price, and then you can get a good deal, and hopefully that area expands out into your area that you bought that house, and then your property value goes up, and now you can cash out refinance and do all the fun things you can do. Um, so, in this case, when you're buying a house and then uh, Airbnb it out, you want to just kind of be a little outside of where everyone else wants to be. Mm -hmm. And then what ends up happening is that you don't make as much money on Airbnb that way as you could if you were right in the middle of the hot spots. Mm -hmm. But you're getting all your numbers around makes more sense because you're getting a better deal and then you're getting a long-term investment. And then if it ever needs to be converted back into a normal traditional rental, then by the time, if that takes a year or five years from now, you've already built up a whole lot of money through your Airbnb income. And when you convert it back into it, then your property value is higher, so your rent's gonna be way higher than your mortgage. 
So it is a little more important for you to be mindful of the location whenever you're doing the buy, turn Airbnb into it. And if you're thinking about a 30 year thing, when you're thinking about Airbnb investing in rental arbitrage, it might be a year, it might be two, three, four years. I'm thinking 30 years out, there's gonna be a 30 year mortgage and this will be my retirement. So where do I want my retirement house to be? With his example, if you were gonna do what he says, look at George R. Brown Center in Houston, you could buy in Midtown for a certain price, or you can buy in Edo for a certain price, and they're both the same exact distance from George R. Brown. Yeah, I would buy in Edo. Airbnb travelers care about what I call radial proximity from a point of interest. They don't care what neighborhood. They want to know how far is my Uber from the point of interest. So you can go into Edo, pick up a property, and they'll, they'll, they'll be a four minute Uber away where you try to buy in Midtown, you're gonna pay triple the price for some condo with less square footage. And keep in mind, people from coming in to, for a convention center, like we have the K, Bell, K Bailey, whatever, um, there's a lot of people that come in for conventions and mm -hmm. they're not doing research on the area before they come here. So they don't know if they're over at George R. Brown, they don't know that East Downtown isn't as developed as Midtown. If they're from Chicago or Philadelphia or whatever, like they're just like, oh look, there's where I want to be, and there's the house. Great, I'm there. But people in town are gonna be like, yeah, I don't want to walk around back there at night. And so if you can get a better deal closer to your proximity, um, then that that works out for the people that are coming in for conventions and, mm -hmm. and business purposes. Yep. But as far as like if you're trying to do my my method uh, on one of the houses for like the event stuff, just plan on that being it needs to be a little nicer in a little nicer area because there's gonna be a lot of locals using your event space and they know, like, I'm not going down to Fair Park to do this. But not too excited. nice, so your neighbors aren't like, I demand right. my neighborhood to be a certain way. This is a fact, this yep. has been an issue. And that's why he hunts for properties that are like what he thinks to be the racehorse picks. It, they've got to meet all of his metrics. Because the last thing you want is like to have an HOA neighborhood where, you're, where your neighbor shuts you down. That'd be and, gross. And a lot of ah. people uh, on- it's Way gross, give me the shivers, you know what I'm saying? Quick, uh, quick tidbit and then we'll move on, but um, a lot, of, whenever I'm, I'm with my Airbnb uh, investors, when we're out looking at houses, like, ooh, I don't know if I want to be next to that neighbor. It looks like they, uh, looks like they might be, uh, might be shady a little bit. I'm like, that's what we are looking for. Yes. Because if they're kind of being a little off and like they keep the property up, but they don't, probably don't want anyone messing with them. They probably want to just be like, you're having a party. As long as you do you, I do me, let's leave it alone. But if the neighbors have perfect rose beds and everything's yeah, perfectly is. clean and cut, and it's like, they're probably going to give you a hard time whenever they see a bunch of random people walking up and down their sidewalks whenever mm -hmm. they have people over. And so what you think might be the thing you're looking for is actually the thing you should not want uh, a lot of times. To both of you, I have a question. Yep. Um, so Can we answer at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three, shoot. One at a time. Yep, and then this guy asked a question. He had his hand raised too, so after you, him, because he's being polite. So. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, so my question is uh, to, for both of you. Um, so you, I know you do more buy and hold, right? Mm -hmm. And not the rental arbitrage. We're doing rental arbitrage. And you're doing buy and hold as well. But how do you find your, your properties? Do you actually like to look for the actual area? Or just as an opportunity comes, the, there's a property for sale in a particular area. Do you aim for that? Like, for, you know, for example, other investors wholesaling and stuff that bring you a deal. Do you look at that? Or do you actually more... Um, looking at certain areas. Within, for, within Dallas. For us two, you want to yeah. say so, us two? Us two, okay. I've been talking a lot, so go for it. Sure, so uh, great question is pretty much how are you how are you finding your properties in great areas, right? Um, I used to do a lot, like what, what I told you guys about earlier, hey, I see a rent sign, let me call you up, see what's going on like that, right? But over the years, it's been, we've established a business, incredible buyers, where we work with you know six or seven realtors that really know our criteria, so we don't we don't need huge margins like maybe some people do because we we have our in-house contracting, we have our in-house rental management. None of this is going outside, so uh, we're not looking as much as building relationships. So I think a biggest part of that is not necessarily, hey, look, I need to go hunting, right? It's let me let me build some good relationships with some, with some people that are like-minded in the industry and maybe an area I want to buy that know the area really well. Okay. So basically establish a relationship with people that know what you're looking for. Correct. That would be Airbnb friendly or a spot where you think that would do well or are you actually just focusing on first the, the buy and hold for long term and then eventually putting in the Airbnb to see if that would work for 
and years. Great question. So there's actually a third one that we, we stick to first. Our foundational, I say ow, oh, it's me and my business partner. Our, our foundational criteria is we have to be able to buy it, fix it the way we like, and sell it for more. That's foundational. So your your That's one. right. Okay. And if we can't do that, then it's, it's an easy pass. Okay, good. The second thing is, are we going to cash flow long term? So, you know, there's, there's criteria within this criteria, but basically, hey, if I rent this out, can I make, you know, 200, 300 bucks a month on it long term? And then the third thing we do is we always try short term rentals. Now, this is relatively new for us as, as a company. I've been doing it for a couple years in my, uh, in my house with a room, but for us, we've been doing it for, we're, we're almost at a year, not quite. Um, but everything we, we, we buy and we flip, it's okay, let's short term this, let's see how it performs. And then if not, we can always take a step back, long term it, all that furniture goes to the next property, and it's just a cycle. And then for me, like, basically, I agree with everything you just said. So basically, that just, I'm just gonna rip, rip what you just did. But I'm gonna expand on it a little bit in the sense that um, the metrics that I always have to hit, because my, m the most important thing for me is I gotta watch out for my buyer's best interest. Like, long term, I want them to not be like, Sean, I trusted you, this is everything I had, and now I lost everything. <laughs> I don't want that, like, that's not what my goal is. And so um, I want to make sure it makes sense normal investment purposes. So the reason why I use the MLS is that there's deals to be had. I mean, don't listen to any of your real estate agents that say like, well, you got to do list pricing because the market's so hot. Every single house I've sold in the last year and a half, two years in a hot market has been a huge spread on what I've got to praise for and then what, we, what I end up negotiating the price down to. Uh, so you can, as long as you're not emotionally connected to every, like this is the house. It's like, okay, well, you gotta let go of that a little bit because it's not the house if it doesn't give you the best deal. Um, so you need to basically put out a lot of offers on different houses and see which one makes the most sense financially for you. Uh, so that's the way that you get around uh, getting crap deals in the MLS because we always get great deals in the MLS. Uh, but you can, there is an option for you to get wholesaling options and uh, if you door knock and mass mailers, but it's just not needed. Like we don't need to do that. That's more stress. We might be able to get a little better numbers, but I'm just all about like, stress avoidance and I just don't want to deal with it. Uh, but if you do want to do that, great, go for it. Like, if some people have like a system set up and they just do it, and that's cool. Yeah, the we buy cash thing. Yeah, you do you do flyers, mailers, knock on doors, drop off proposals at people's houses. You can do all sorts of stuff. I just don't want to do that. I just don't have time, uh, honestly. And then what was the rest of the question was, oh, so I need to make sure that it makes sense for like what I would normally do. Because I started off doing this as uh, buy and hold, like all my, all my investors are buy and hold. This is way before Airbnb. So I already have all the metrics in my head. Like I know exactly, this is how much the, the house is, this is how much you're probably gonna put down, this is how much you're gonna be paying per month, this is how much utilities are, and this is how much you're probably gonna need to replace that, and this and this and this. Overall, this is how much you're gonna, I already have it all in my head. And so I walk to a property and say, this is what's going on in the property. This is how much it's gonna cost to get to where it needs to be. And this is how much I think it's gonna rent per month. And so does that make sense? You have a spread, okay, yeah, cool. This is gonna make sense. Now, once we got that and that's checked off, then I say, now for Airbnb, what do we gotta do for Airbnb? All right, so this is gonna be, there's way more square footage than you need. It's not usable square footage, so that's gonna mean you're gonna to have to have extra furniture here. And then there's this whole area in the back we have to deal with, and the backyard is not developed, so we have to put a fence there, and we gotta make sure we put like a cool little entertainment area because people are on Airbnb for entertainment. So then I start doing those numbers. I'm like, okay, well now, for this to make sense, it's gonna take like 20 to 30 grand to make this Airbnb ready. And then with the amount that I think we can get it for, can we get that 30,000 covered and seller contributions and if we go down, okay, so uh, yeah, I say go for it. And then when you go for it, then if so far it's worked out perfectly for everyone. And so, and then I'm always surprised sometimes whenever I'm like, I really hope this works. <laughs> and then as soon as they like, yo, I just got my first booking in 75 days or whatever. I'm like, wow, awesome. I knew it was gonna happen. <laughs> Good. I get nervous every time, but I shouldn't because it's like, you know, if every time that you do something, it always it has the same outcome, you should just be confident in the outcome. But I'm still always like, yes, thank God. And so, uh, but it's not, it's like he's very meticulous, like engineer status. I can figure out in the way that you like, like spreadsheets and financial data. That's not, I'm wild, wild, I'm wild west. So it's like, what's your, what, can you send me your data analysis? So like, I'm like, it's here and it makes sense, and so do it. And, oh, it worked, yeah. What's your analysis? Like? What was your, it was like, I don't know, man. Like, uh, it was good. That's I guess I mean, it worked. Yeah. I know what my cash on cash return is and that's all I care about. I, I mean, I've had, 
on my personal properties, I have like a hundred, I average like 171 cash on cash return to 200% cash on cash return within the first like year, year and a half, which is unheard of. It's unheard of. And so then whenever it's like, you really want to be meticulous about the numbers? Because we have 200% cash on cash return. Like whether it's 170 or 200, come on, get over it, man. Like you're doing great. Just mm -hmm. keep doing it. Yeah. You, sir. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, you. I was just going to follow up earlier on your, uh, on your events house. Um, are you looking for something that has a certain acreage around it or, you know, having kind of more people on the property? How do you navigate that? I've, I've got larger, higher-end homes, and part of it is navigating those tricky issues because we get a lot of that, mm -hmm. a lot of inquiries related to that. We're always trying to make a decision between kind of protecting the house and the neighborhood and thinking of the long term probably with some cash on the table versus, okay, this, this looks like it's going to be reasonable. But it sounds like you're kind of aimed towards that. So I'm wondering if when you're selecting the property, you're just finding some place that just has a little bit more space or, or, or how you're navigating. So like all questions, the answer is it depends. Uh, but let me try to give you a better answer. It depends on the, the buyer. So every buyer has a different purpose. So some buyers, like, I'm, uh, let me answer that and then I'll go into this example. Some buyers, they want to just be super hands off. They're like, I don't want to renovate anything. Just find me a house that's already flipped and that makes sense in a cool area. I just want to put furniture in there and then just, can you even manage it for me? It's like, do you have a cleaning crew? Like, and I'm like, oh my God, you just free money. All right, sure. Uh, and so they just want just free money flowing into their pockets every month with no effort, which it's, you're doing Airbnb, you're doing investing. Investing is effort. Like you have to want to put a little bit of effort into it. But there's some people that just want that. So in that case, the backyard, I try to keep the backyard pretty small. I try to keep the lot pretty small as well. It's just less to maintain and then there's less taxes. Uh, the smaller the lot, the better. And then I know they're not gonna do anything with the house in the end. Like I just, by their mentality, they're not gonna, a, a benefit of having a large lot is that if you ever want to, if the area improves significantly, you can tear down the house and you can put two townhomes on it, or you know three, depending on. We're looking at one house after this. After I'm done here, we gotta check out this other house, and it's a massive lot. So uh, this buyer. So another scenario is like this buyer example. Uh, he is just trusts me full force. He's like, whatever, whatever you say, bro. I'm all in. I'll throw as much money as possible. I was like, all right, well, you got to kind of figure out which way you want to go. The big event house, or do you want the one that you can flip and then put a lot of equity into it? Or do you want the one that like, you don't want any work, the hands off? And he's like, whatever, I don't care. I'm like, all right, well, thanks for the direction. <laughs> um, so this house that we're currently looking at, it's under, it's, it's, uh, it's off of Vernon Street over here in the Bishop Arts area. And it's priced perfectly as it is. I already talked to the listing agent. I already got it negotiated down $10,000 off the decrease of the price that already was decreased. So, I mean, the equity is already built in immediately. Um, but the house is completely from the studs. I mean, in an area that's 1920 houses, it's completely taken down the studs and rebuilt. It's under, we're doing it under market list. So, I mean, as a first time investor, he doesn't have to worry about the roofing being an issue, the hot water heater, the, the air conditioning. It's just all brand new. So like. It's a win, bro. But at the same time, he's not listening to my advice about how large the lot is. I'm like, this is in this particular area. It's 2.8 is the is the taxes, 2.8 percent, and that's pretty high. Uh, and it's a huge lot. I mean, a massive lot. Like the house is here, and the lot's like there. Um, I'm like, if you're gonna buy this house, you need to immediately, as soon as you get into this house. All your money needs to go on putting a nice fence around here, property lighting, and you need to make this like an event, badass, like place that when people, they don't even take a picture of the house as your thumbnail, take a picture of the backyard. And you gotta throw a lot of money in the backyard to make it like worth that extra money that you're spending for that lot and those taxes. And uh, if you don't, then don't buy it. And then find an area for you to build a tiny house, like an ADU, it's called a, like an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, for you to build like a two bedroom in that back so you can expand up into like five bedrooms for that house. That way you can start having this as an event house eventually and then have all your living spaces for the ADU as an outdoor living space because you can only do square footage. It, anyway, I don't want to get into the weeds, but, uh, but having this whole like environment, this whole like beautiful cohesion between the backyard and then the house, and you can do really good on Airbnb. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it depends, man. 
sorry. But, but your rule of thumb here person. is whatever space you get, you have to do well with it, right? So the big yard requires a commitment. Yeah, if you're going to get a big yard, don't just leave it as a big yard. Like, you right. got a big yard, so make it like wet and wild or whatever, uh, Six Flags. Like, you better make that backyard awesome because you're not going to just have like this cool house and then a dilapidated backyard. If you're like, oh, there's a nice house. Oh, look. Mm. Like and it has like chickens next. The neighbors have chickens. And, That's a feature. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah. And so I know. I mean, not the chickens that, not the California chickens, but the, anyways. Um, but yes, did that answer your question? All right, we're gonna try to get fast. Right at like one percent. Across the board, I've seen like a lot of different people. Oh, like the conversion. Um, well, the more occupied you are, the lower your conversion is going to be because people are going to see your place, but you're not going to be able to. Like, there's a lot of window shoppers that look and you're not gonna be able to book them because your calendar's already compromised from other bookings. When your calendar's wide, wide open, you should get somewhere closer to two, 2.4% booking conversion when you have a, like a, full, like a fully available cal calendar. But when your listing is constantly like booked half the time and you're filling out little spaces, you're, you're gonna see that you're at like 1.5, some, some, maybe 1% 1, 1 only, but 1.5 is what I will see for uh, running listings that constantly have bookings in there already. Airbnb no, absolutely not. Airbnb Plus, they will try to force you to make certain accommodate. You have to do certain stuff with the space, and they make you follow certain rules. Like I don't even believe work collections are worth it because you have to be moderate. Moderate cancellation booking policy, and I'm not dropping down to moderate for work collection. Sorry, no, out. Yep. So if you want more money, diversify and get on Booking.com. Right. Instead of like jumping through every single like pony trick um, that uh, Airbnb wants, because even stay, staying super host, you might have to make compromises you don't want to have to make for your pocket to stay super host. You can always just make a new account and be super host again later. I mean, Most important question is um, what targets do you guys try to hit? Um, I guess you develop to turn into own short term rentals. Uh, what say a 12 month lease, let's just say the house is generating 2000 on a 12 month lease. What percentage are you shooting on a short term rental in comparison? and also on the arbitrage model. If you're renting for a certain amount, what kind of uh, increase versus that rent you're shooting for typically on, a, mm -hmm. on an average property? <clears throat> You want to answer your spread, like you, what so you typically get in rent? For all my, I have not had a single one of my clients buy a house and after like their second month of listing it, they have not gone below double what they would have got um, traditionally renting it. Mm -hmm. But then it can go even higher than double. So double yeah. is like the minimum that we get. And that's Dallas, and Dallas is a little oversaturated, so double is probably a good responsible number that you should shoot for. Like in Houston, I'll pick up a, a 1300 uh, a month lease and I'll go for 28 to 3100 as my just like my standard average revenue for the space. Um, but I also price for multi month, like I want monthly booking. So I've got monthlies that are getting, they're paying me like 2400 plus Airbnb fees, and then I've got other like short-term rental ones like where they're two-day, three-day at a time. And so my, my weighted average, I'm trying to go for about three grand on a 1,300 is what I'm trying to get. Philadelphia, um, I've, got my, I've got ones that are like 1,550, and we're getting like 170 a day. I haven't done my final math, but we're probably over four grand on a, on a studio in Philadelphia for 1500 in so um, and at that point running lean like if you have many 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 leases if it costs you an extra $15 a day to operate because of your cleaning the way you structure your cleanings or other things other little losses that'll greatly affect your profit because every dollar you make in rental arbitrage goes towards your costs first and then you've contributed to your costs and now you're contributing to your margin at the end so the last 10 days of your of your month is your profit the first 20 days of booking when you get paid from Airbnb it's like oh this is next month's rent this is electricity, this is insurance, right? And then you're like, uh, by the 13th, you're getting payouts that are profit, or 17th, you're getting payouts that are profit. And that's kind of the game. Um, you, can make, you can make money um, in a market if you have good operation strategy where you pick up leases that are 1,100 a month and you're getting 1,900 a month in revenue and you're only making an extra 800 a month on the lease, but the way you operate, because it's like you're getting a lot of monthlies or a lot of weeklies, you're spending you know, 125 on utilities and 75 to $100 in cleaning and like business supply. You're making what $400 a month on top of your costs. But if you stacked a bunch of 900 to 1,000 a month little studios and you're making 400 a piece, like and let's say somebody had like an eight unit and you rented an eight unit from a buddy who owned it and that was your spread, 400 a month on his property on all eight of his units. Well, now you're passively, semi-passively making a little over three grand on his one property. 
Um, so you can run super, super lean and have low margins and still make it happen. Um, my worst performing properties here, here is in Dallas. It's in the medical center. And our, our leases are like 1150 to 1200 And we, we don't do well on single night or three night long bookings. But when we price effectively, we'll pick up like multi-month bookings. And that's where we make all of our money because the property just cannot compete with the quality that Dallas has. So that's, we've had to differ, like, differ, differentiate. So I hope that was a fun answer for you. And then you afterwards. So uh, you know, you're doing rental arbitrage, you're doing buy and hold. You all consider, I'm assuming you can have least consider it. And landlord first and with landlord a short term. Flips, landlord. Yep. Traditional, yeah. more traditional real estate, fix and flip. Yep. Have you considered doing management for other like, property man, Airbnb property man? We do. Uh, we do. So we currently clean his properties and other host properties. Yeah. We have a percentage fee based structure for other hosts where we take, we've, we've got a guy named Seth. Um, that we have his properties. So I'll consult for people on the way in um, and then if they don't want to run it, we'll, do, we'll charge a fee. So at this, like in my world, you get to a scale where you, you've systemized everything and then you have employees and those employees have a little extra time on their hands. And you, so you sell off that human resource to another host who needs it. And so we're, we of course have the expertise and years in the game. So our employees are gonna make less mistakes than if that guy hired his own employees, in the meantime at least. So yeah, um, scale to diversify. Actually, we're, I've got three courses we'll be selling in like one mega course system. And the third one is operating at the million dollar plus revenue level and what to build if you wanna have 50 plus units. All the companies you start to service your business, how to sell those to other hosts. And yeah, that should be your long game is to essentially uh, offset your, your costs by getting paid from other hosts for stuff that you've built that they can't. And then I have a, a guy that's my real estate assistant and he just wants some extra money. So I was like, all right, I'll just pay a couple hundred dollars a month to, uh, to just do whatever I want at my properties. And he's got really good at doing whatever I want. Like, yo man, the gas is off, can you go over there? And he'll drive from Arlington to go over there and just sit there waiting for the atmosphere guy to come. Uh, today he went all the way to one of my properties and sat there at 8 a.m. to like 12 waiting for the 18T guy to show up. So if you have like a guy that's uh, like that, I mean, he's he's done so well. Like I'm like, yo, there's a, not yo, hey Josh. Uh, <laughs> yo Josh. <laughs> yo Josh, where you at bro? Uh, uh, I'm like, there's a lot of weeds coming up in the walkway. I have a, uh, I have a wedding coming through this weekend, uh, the backyard wedding, can you pull up the weeds? And so he's kind of, it's not like property management as much as like a guy that is taking ownership over the house and he just is always in there making sure the cleaners do well, like he's, he's on it. So he's like the homeowner, like a really nitpicky homeowner. And so he's gotten so good at that that I'm actually uh, allowing him to expand out into some of my clients as well. So he's like the boots on the ground guy that is making sure the light bulb's out. All right, so he'll go to Walmart and pick up the light bulb and, He's that guy. He's the go-to guy. So Airbnb property management is not like normal property management. Normal property management, a guy is like, you might spend an hour a month on each property that you manage just because you're like just handling the small little things. But property management, like normally, is not that hands-on. Airbnb property management, you're in there. You're taking out the trash every week. You're pulling the trash back in. Like you're, you're doing it. So Yeah, weekly trash in single-family homes. That is a pain. Yeah, that's I'd love a pain. to touch on that too. Yeah. Just the importance of a team and somebody, you know, and building it early on. Uh, it took us a little bit to learn this, but you know, through bus you know, a couple of different business ventures, you, you learn. And I mean, you learned this as well. You touched mm -hmm. on it. Both mm -hmm. you guys did. This is awesome. Like, I take no credit for things that I do anymore. Like, it's I want to take you know what gets built, and it's an encouragement. It's, it's other people doing it, right? And so, really, just encouraging them and giving them. Uh, the creativity with their strengths and letting them run with it. That's so important, especially early on. So if you have an idea of, uh, you know, hey, I want to have three, I want to have four, I want to have five, Airbnb arbitrage or whatever it is, it's probably more valuable from my experience in your best interest to find someone that has the same passion as you and uh, walk with them, encourage them and send them off and just have full confidence in them. They're going to make mistakes and that's fine. You've walked through it, but then you can walk through with them. And that value is, surpasses, I would say, any other value in uh, running your business. We teamed up because of our shared passion for Dragon Ball Z, and we're like, this is going to happen. We're going to build an empire on this passion for Fusion. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> for, these guys get that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> My man. Oh, uh, 
So yeah, I like your team structure because you have some folks that should focus on the more traditional real estate and you have other folks who can really focus on the Airbnb mm. business aspect of it. It's, it's super fun, but a lot of it's the same. Uh, you give other people ownership for what you're building. You build it to a point where somebody else can grab it and it doesn't fall out of their hands, and you let them look at it and inspect it, and you're not gonna get productivity out of them right away because they're coming to understand your world, and you just kind of create air, in corporate world, they call it air coverage, right? The managers provide air coverage for their direct rapport so they can make mistakes where the bosses above you don't like come rain fire down on the employees that you have in your stead. So it's the same thing. When you're your new business owner, you create a safe environment for them to pick up your business and play with it, disassemble it a little bit, put it back together. And then once they feel like they understand it and they've interacted with it enough, um, and they go through the highs and lows of that business operation, they become more and more connected to the outcome of your business and eventually they adopt this, I want it to succeed, this is my business too. And from there you can really truly count on somebody because that's the biggest part of uh, the risk of owning a business is you're, you wonder like what happens if somebody fails you and then your business just evaporates because that's what all business is, is people doing something together. And if your employees disappeared one day, your business would cease to exist. But if you, if you really trust in the fact that other people do take ownership for things that they don't actually own because they still own the outcomes. And that's how you build a business. I want to brag on him just real quick. Uh, he's also really, really good at taking advice and just acting on it. Like he said earlier, just act, like do something. Uh, he, he did such a great job. We started this large travel thing where we go in and traveling and then I'm trying to like work half our year and travel the other half a year. And it wasn't as fun with him when we first got started because he had so many units and the entire time he's just on his phone. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yo, look up, man, it's awesome. And he's like, that is awesome. Picture. And then back. And the entire time, like, I feel like I'm traveling by myself. Uh, and then this, the next trip we went on, he's like, I'm going to make it a habit to get better at automating this. Next trip, it was like 75% of him on the phone. And then he started getting loosening up a little bit. But ever since then, each trip, he's gotten more and more to the point to where it's 50%. Thailand, it was like 50, 50, 25%. But then we just got back from Costa Rica and I didn't see him on his phone like the entire time. It was like the first time that he just was there. Like, and he, like, I, I have my friend, like, oh, there he is. He's not staring at his phone the whole time. And so what's really cool about you guys in this room and the people that watch this channel is that he has systematically gone through all of this. Like I've seen the process. Like he's gone through all of the hurdles that you guys would have to go through, and he just is like giving it to you. Mm. Good job, man. Gracias. Well, uh, he Actually, was I, want, I want to pick up on that. Um, I'm assuming that there's a couple of people in here that haven't started yet, but are in the process of doing so. Mm. Can you run through the checklist of getting your ducks in a row, and then once you hit that point? Hit the ground running. Oh, that's a that's like a bird's eye ducks in a row view. This is gonna uh, be like a forty five minute. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, I can't I'm not gonna give a forty five minute answer. Um, but I can I can give you some really good starter stuff. So uh, in arbitrage you need to form an LLC. That LLC has to get approved for a lease, so you've got to go through that process, right? Um, you can get it done in Bradstreet number. Here's a little hack. They normally try to sell you on expediting it, like 200 bucks or more, or you have to wait two months for it. And you can do it where you get it same day. Uh, you go to dunnandbradstreet.com to make your Dun and Bradstreet number. It asks you, why do you need your Dun and Bradstreet number? And you just go, there's a little like check boxes, and the bottom one says that you may be applying for a government grant. It might be. So you click on that and you get your Dun & Bradstreet number immediately because the government forces Dun & Bradstreet to release that because Dun & Bradstreet is the biggest player in business credit tracking. So, so the age of your Dun & Bradstreet number affects uh, your maturation of a company according to like, like uh, apartment complexes. So that's one. Start a business bank account, get cash in there. You can move cash in and out of your bank account for like up to three years, I think, because when you start a new LLC, you're allowed to capitalize it. Um, so research um, Texas state law on financing or capitalizing new businesses, but you're allowed to move money in and out and it's not going to screw with your personal income and how you claim it. If you own your own property, that's a completely different starting path, right? I'm going to talk on that. Yeah. Uh, so during my speaking part. Yeah. So if you have zero properties, right? You have zero properties. You can either buy one, you can co-host, or you can arbitrage, right? Co-hosting is a lot like arbitrage in a way, except instead of pay, not instead of paying rent and being a leasee, you have a landlord 
assume full risk of his property and he gets you get a performance fee on his property and that's co-hosting it's like the lightest touch model for airbnb you charge 15 to 25 percent of revenue and you manage his property for him as a co-host but you have no rights to the property he can cut you out at any time you're a service provider rental arbitrage you have a lease they can't eject you until the end of your lease and non-renew you Right? So if you have a three-year lease with a landlord and you're arbitraging, you're protected for three years unless you do something stupid to get ejected. Co-hosting, you have to get them to sign an agreement, and they're not going to sign a three-year co-host agreement where they're not going to use another co-host. Right? They don't want to give you that much power. By, so at arbitrage, you lease pick up your own properties. Co-host, you get other, host, like other owners to trust you with theirs. If you build good relationships and are sticky, they may not leave you, and then you can own. Those are the three paths. One, um, one more, just real quick. Uh, if anyone is, has, has anyone heard of rent to own? Mm -hmm. That's another option that if you can find a rent to own deal, then you're kind of doing a hybrid of what I do and what he does. Mm -hmm. And so you're starting off and you're building this trust and relationship with it. You're paying down, paying the owner, and then you're speeding up the process for the profits you get from that. If you don't have a lot of money, you can't really get started with owning. That's a way to kind of like do a hybrid hack mm -hmm. and it gets you into owning your property yeah. faster. And on that, there's also, you can, you can own or finance a deal, which is like rent to own, and then you can syndicate your down payment if you want to do a, like a, a down payment free attack and you don't have a VO, VA loan like this guy, which gives you no down payment loan. You can syndicate the 20% down payment for an interest like property, start an LLC, everybody puts 20% for the down payment into that LLC. The LLC finances the down payment and becomes an added party in the purchase of a home. So you can syndicate a down payment and then get the mortgage and work out a deal that way. There's tons of ways to pick up a property and start it. You can master lease, which is where like that buddy who has the eight unit property and he's thinking about selling his eight unit property but he's, he's not sure, it's underperforming. You go in and say, I'll sign a lease for the whole property. I'm in charge of maintenance and everything else but I can also tear walls down if I want to and I get less rent and that's what a master lease is. So there's tons of ways to start. It's a lot. Can you go directly back to uh, the part of financing that LLC, pulling money out and putting it back in mm -hmm. for the course of time? Like we the one of these. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to do these every month. Um, so, you f form an LLC, business bank account, Dun & Bradstreet number, EIN number by calling the IRS and getting an EIN. Those are the things you need. And then you need, your, you need trade lines, which means you're going to do business with companies like Quill, Seton, which is S-E-T-O-N, um, Granger is another one. Jexa Energy, if you get a business account for electricity, Jexa does report to Dun & Bradstreet. Um, and a lot of these businesses, you're looking for a net 20 or a net 30 where you buy something, but you have 30 days to pay, right? And you pay your net 30 on time, you have a business trade line that's positive. And those trade lines are how your Paydex score and your other business credit scores get like validated. So you start making this purchase. You can go to Chevron, get a Chevron business like gas card. They'll approve you pretty easily. Office Depot can be an easy one to get. Um, so there's all these different companies, right? So as you're putting money in your business bank account, you want to put in, you want to cash flow 4x or whatever your rent should be for a property. And what's great about this, you could be picking up five or six leases somewhere, but when you make your application for one property or one of your six leases, they're gonna look that you're making 4X whatever the rent is. Like if it's 1,500, they wanna see 6,000 coming into your bank account. You could apply for all six separately and they just look at the same $6,000 six times and approve you six times over. So you don't need that much cash flow. If you do a bigger deal where you go to like the developers or the regional of the property management company, they'll wanna see more. Um, so LLC, filings like Dun & Bradstreet, EIN, trade lines, cash in and out. You probably need about four months of cash flow in and out in order to cover your basis for what different property management companies need. And that way you can get approved for your lease. You'll then call around and say, hey, I'm a corporate housing company. Do you do corporate leases? Um, and that's gonna be how you start that conversation because they're gonna screen out somebody who's like, oh, I wanna be an Airbnb host. Hey, could I Airbnb at your apartment? They're like, no, right? So they understand corporate housing and Airbnb hosting is very much similar to corporate housing. And you, you're gonna sell through analogy from corporate housing into the space of listing on a short-term rental, rental website. I have a script for it, but it's something that I don't share, um, except with my clients that are like on an ongoing contract. But that's what you're planning to do, is be prepared to be approved as an LLC, because being an LLC bypasses subletting law. You just declare your occupants under your LLC, and as long as you have permission from the building to host or, or to you know, list on third-party websites to get your occupants, then you're good to go. Um, and so every 
property management company may use a different screening software like, like Yardi or Yardi Pro or RealSite or OnePage. What's fun, ha well, fun hack, we did this one at Mline Tower before they changed management companies. Yardi Pro, you can have five references that they'll call your references and say, hey, is this company legit? And they go, yeah. And if the three of them go, yeah, he's legit, you get approved, they don't even look at your financials. We picked up a lease without anything but me calling a bunch of people going, hey, they're gonna call you, say that I don't owe you money, I've been never late on my payments, cool? And they called those people, they're like, all right, this company's clear, we're good, Yardi Pro. Yardi, Yardi Naive, actually, is what they should be called because it was the easiest application I've ever seen. So you're going to go building to building and some of them you're gonna get approved for, some of them you won't. Some will require that your business or the Dun & Bradstreet trade lanes are two years old. I mean, it's a really a mixed bag. And so it, there's gonna be kind of like a law of averages here but do all the things in the beginning so your business is ready at least to start picking up leases. I got my first one two days after my LLC was formed in California. So, I mean, some are just stupid easy. Does a business credit card count as a trade line? Um, it, does it? Do you it see? counts as a trade line, but I, it doesn't have to do with your Dun uh, yeah, Dun & Bradstreet Dun & doesn't Bradstreet. report credit cards, they don't report so. utility bills, they don't report rents. So there's different, like Equifax or Experian? It'll, it'll be will show. very important when you're going to a bank for commercial lending as opposed to your typical, hey, I'm buying this, you know, I, I have a different eyesight on this because I'm, I'm buying homes and he's doing rental arbitrage. But yeah, commercial lending is a whole different beast. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's about numbers and cents. Mm -hmm. And so things like that matter. So we still got secured credit cards from Wells Fargo. As soon as we started our LLC, we gave them 500 bucks and they gave us a secured credit card. Same, same deal, just in case. Because I didn't understand that financing side yet. I'm like, we might need this. But after six months of having a secured card, they give you your $500 back and give you a real one. Ta-da. So yeah, just try everything in the beginning and get it all set up. Cover as many bases as you can and let your LLC mature. Um, there's other hacks, like you can have three members of your LLC and it reclassifies the way your like, LLC is looked at in order to getting financing. Um, but that's also a long rabbit hole too. Talk we'll about talk that. Real quick, um, again, back to that bank account, putting in a lump sum of money and then taking it out. So they want to see monthly deposits. Mm -hmm. They're just going to look at your deposits withdrawal statements. It doesn't have to be elegant. They just want to see that that deposit sum is greater than 4x of what your rent would be. Yeah. Every month. Ten minutes till five. Okay, so um, we, we got, let's let's give ten more minutes for questions, and then we're gonna spend the like last little bit um, to uh, like for social time. Did you have a question? Yeah, yes. yeah. You guys have been really nice. Snowballing earlier, mm -hmm. uh, but when did you decide to take profit? Like, at what point was your portfolio big enough for you to say, okay, let's start taking money out? There when I couldn't first. spend it fast enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's it. I mean, so for me, like, I'm like, I, I need money to live on, right? But my media company was already making some money, so I wasn't really, like, going to look at where my money was going to come from. And so I would just reinvest as much money as I thought I could. And if you saw my one video, like, how I built it fast, remember I said I would project what my final revenues at the end of the month were going to be? And I'm like, okay, so I'll need this much of my final revenues for all my expenses, so let me take a portion of what my excess looks like and reinvest it into new property, knowing that I was going to get some revenue on those new property so I'm really like like Makes really so nervous man he does that and I'm like man you're just the not, best you're just going all in you just like but I'm not taking play, on debt you play it's no debt with him, like he's just always like oh I'm all in I'm like dude this is like the second hand <laughs> and he's like yeah all in let's do it the, like, you you recognize those all in moments though that's that you have to recognize those all in moments and you're gonna lose sometimes but that's okay remember what I said you gotta be crazy to make crazy money and seriously he does crazy things like, scared money don't make money that's right scared money sh shrivels up it folds itself. Yeah. Um, when did you know to hire your first employee? A housekeeper uh, at five properties because you want to give, I believe in hiring my housekeepers by the hour because certain people will work for a certain number per hour, but if you want to pay them per unit, they'll want more money because they don't think in commissions. Right. They don't think in units, but people will think in hours and hours is safe. So I want to hire somebody at a safe number for them where I still get ahead coming out at a value so I can operate my business. If you pay somebody $12 an hour in Houston to clean, but you only have a couple studios, you can't give them enough work for that to be safe. They're going to live on your wage, right? You need to give them enough hours to justify your income. So if you only have three properties, pay 16 an hour, right? And you should still come ahead as opposed to paying somebody $50 per unit to clean. But get up to five or six properties and pay 12 and then when you pay that 12 an hour, the, you'll be, at the end of the week, you'll have that new employee making the same or maybe a little bit more as that first employee, but you're going to get more total value out of that employee. 
And if you hire somebody at 12 an hour because you advertise at 12 an hour and they're like, I want a job at 12 because I was just working for 10, you're not a bad person for paying somebody 12 an hour when they were making 10. The key is to be a good boss, right? <coughs> Give somebody a good life. Um, they need a day off, be understanding. Like that's the worst bosses that I knew were the ones that were uncompromising about little things. Like, oh, you're 15 minutes late, right? They're gonna, you could take their income, take their job because they're 15 minutes late to work sometimes. So being a good boss isn't exactly about the bottom line dollar that you're paying. Give people a good quality of life, be honest about your expectations for the work and what you're hiring for, and then in exchange, um, the, you're gonna have a good contract between that person. But to give you your direct answer, five units you can hire a housekeeper. Hire a housekeeper for every five or six units because let's say everybody checks out on a Sunday. Sundays are our craziest day. Everybody checks out on a Sunday, you have 30 apartments to clean, and you only have three housekeepers because you usually only have like seven to clean every day, but you have 30 that day, your, third, your three housekeepers aren't cleaning 10 per, right? You'll need six housekeepers because you can get them to do five. In a hotel, a, a housekeeper will clean about 14 apart, like 14 home, like units, rooms in, in a hotel because everything's so easy. There's a bed and there's like very little to do, but homes, they've got to go from home to home to home. When we have all of them in the same building, I can get a housekeeper to clean three or four apartments in the same building in about two and a half or three hours. And then they can go to another one and do another three or four in another two and a half or three hours. So from 11 to four, we can get, they'd be wrapping up the other set of three or four. So you could squeeze seven or eight out of one housekeeper if they only have to work in two buildings. But logistics is what's gonna slow you down. Did you train the cleaners yourself? Or Absolutely. You okay. I started, but now I have somebody who trains the cleaners for me. So when you spread yourself too thin, you're not gonna do a good job. Like if you're too busy to train a housekeeper, like hey, here's my place, right? Here's a, here's a checklist, right? Here's some quick, like frequently asked questions and here's some best practices, read these, sign these to let me know that you read them and then trust them to do their job. It's not that simple, right? So you need to have somebody give them a more thorough orientation. So lead, having free leadership units of resource, every hour of leadership has a value to your business, right? You're gonna allocate those units of leadership to people as needed. If you have no free resource of leadership because you're too busy to be a leader, your employees are going to be like unattended children, right? And that's going to cost you money. There's a lot of truth to what he just said, and don't take it lightly. <laughs> don't take it lightly. Uh, and uh, I know someone mentioned about, hey, what, you know, what's the, the starting plan um, from start to finish? How do you get it? But I think building a team, building a relationship, and you get in what you put out is extremely valuable. We talked about like encourage your people. That's the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. If you encourage them, give them ownership, let them run with it, build confidence, then uh, they're, they're gonna do a great job. And then when the next person comes, you're building your business out. Hey, uh, Susan, do you mind training Maria how to clean this? You know our houses? Take them over to this house over here, do it with them. Okay, do it again. And now you're building a, the snowball effect of mm -hmm. you know, Thank everyone's you. training each other. Appreciate you. Yeah. Oh, here. I have successfully done it with the Airbnb model. No. Uh, is that the last question? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's an option. It's just no one, I, no one that I've worked with has taken that option, and it's just a much more complicated option. And I personally am not going to facilitate that because it's going to take way too much stress and brain energy. Yeah. I'm going to get paid very little out of it, and so go for it. Leases well, for single family homes. Leases in general, leases for single family homes. I don't touch because I barely get paid on it. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you're trying to like basically sell a house to somebody as a lease option, I'm gonna get paid as a lease, but they're actually buying a house. It's like, why would I? And then I have to go out and find the owners who are willing to do that. Just extra effort for at least less amount of money. So if you want to lease single family homes, go to the neighborhood and look for realtor for lease signs in those neighborhoods, because what'll happen is you've got like your like backyard quarterback realtor who knows the neighborhood really well. And that's what I did in Philadelphia is I picked up a realtor who knows the neighborhood and he just knows all the homeowners and he gets all the deals for the leases and, this, and stuff like that. And he's the one who like warm handshakes my my lease pickups for single family homes in Philly. So he hasn't done that because he's like a totally different sector. Real estate's a wide, wide world, right? So you can find a real estate agent that specializes in finding neighborhood landlords who need help leasing out. I don't know if Dallas needs that help, but um, there are landlords who probably still use a real estate agent just because they think that they should. So there, there could be people out there to help. Yeah, or the real estate agent's the one that sold the house to them and they did like a renovation and now they said that I'll list it for you like, you know, I'll, I'll do you a favor and list it for you as a rental and then, yeah, but I mean, that's... Yeah, there's stuff like that. Um, this was fun. I, we, our Q&A ran longer than I thought. I know yeah, that, that we still didn't an answer all the questions. So um, let's like hang out for a little bit so we can still like answer questions one-on-one um, -on -one a bit and let us all just kind of workshop. But that way people who have obligations can still let themselves out without having to worry about it.